Hello, welcome back to the show. And I'm very excited today to have a very special guest, David Murrow, who is the author of the landmark book, Why Men Hate Going to Church. Thanks for holding that up. Uh, I, I asked him to um, to bring it because mine's Kindle. I, a lot of the books I are on a Kindle, it's not as exciting to hold up the Kindle, particularly since my Kindle is uh, splashed up. So thanks for coming. I appreciate it. It's great to be with you, Aaron. Thank you. And there is a link to buy that book on Amazon in the show notes. And if you actually buy through that link, I get like five cents or something. Uh, so, so and, and I get two cents. There so you go. There you go. You. That's yeah. that's uh, that's the way to do it. And if you haven't hit subscribe on YouTube yet, hit the subscribe button. And if you're not on the Masculinist uh, list yet, go to themasculinist.com and get on it. So again, uh, David, thanks for joining. I probably read your book in 2012. Um, which I think may have been like right after a second edition or something came out. I'm not sure exactly how yeah. I found it. And I always like to say this was pre-Great Awakening, sort of really before I transformed my thinking about men's issues. But it was one of those sort of like pre-events that got me thinking, like, man, something's just off here uh, in it. And then later that kind of congealed, and I continued to refer back to it. So when was the book actually originally published? Uh, the first edition came out in 2005 and was immediately reviewed in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, really made quite a splash because it uh, it looked at a religious issue from a sociological perspective. My background is anthropology, so mm. I didn't come at this as a pastor or a seminarian. I just held the church out and said, you know, what would an anthropologist say about what's going on as far as uh, gender roles in the church? And then the revised issue that you're referring to came out in 2011. Yeah. Well, I, I thought it was a great book. And again, it's still worth going back to today and looking, and even though it came out in 2005, you know, some of the stuff yeah. we'll talk about later on is I think you were actually prescient on some issues uh, that people may have said, you know, may have pushed back on at the time, but, but now they're there. Um, did you pick the title yourself? Uh, went back and forth. Uh, my original version was why men don't go to church. Mm -hmm. And my editor said, well, they go, but they don't like it. And so <laughs> I wanted to use the word hate. He, he didn't like that word on a Christian book, but, uh, you know, it, it really does describe the emotion that men, particularly younger men feel when they uh, think about going to church. You know, what's interesting is, uh, young men don't hate Jesus. They don't hate God. Uh, they don't even necessarily hate uh, religious practices. What they hate is the mechanics of going to church, the ideas of organized religion, sitting in a row, uh, sacramental sort of things. It's just meaningless to men in, in many cases, unless they themselves grew up religious. So that's one of the gaps we're having to deal with is this perception mm -hmm. among men that it's unmanly to go to church. Yeah. So uh, that was, that was a, I thought the title was great, to be quite honest, because it's like, Sim I say it's simple, direct, masculine. It's everything you're talking about kind of encapsulated in the title. You know, none of this, oh, can't we all just get along? That Nope, men hate going to church and what's going on with that. So how did you get interested in the topic again? Well, as I said, my background is in anthropology, and I was sitting in church one Sunday, and my mind was drifting during a sermon. I know that never happens to you, <laughs> but— uh, uh, I began to fall back on my ethnographic training from college, hmm. and I looked at my my church and asked, is this a matriarchy or a, pa or a patriarchy? And hmm. I looked at all the symbols in the room, and there was quilts and flowers and hmm. banners and lace and ribbons. And I looked at the pastor, and he was wearing a robe and a multicolored stole, and he was speaking of love and beauty and relationships and hmm. nurturing and harmony. And then I looked at the volunteer opportunities in the bulletin, and it was for child care and cooking and caring for the sick. And and I, I and and then I looked around the room, and I counted noses, and over sixty percent of those noses had lipstick underneath. No. And I began to realize in that moment that our church was designed to enthrall and engage a woman with an empty nest, a fifty-five plus woman who wanted who wanted to be stay busy, who wanted to have children in her arms. And everything about that institution was designed to thrill and enthrall her. And there was almost nothing to animate the heart of a young man. Hmm. Yeah, the, the quote that I, uh, I, I took out of the book here, it says, no matter what the name on the outside, there are always more women on the inside 
the men who do show up for services often seem passive, bored, or uneasy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think you know, I definitely sense some of that. It varies. It varies by by church. But mm -hmm. what what are kind of the stats? What what is the ratios today? Uh, you, you know, in terms of who attends. Yeah. Well, when I did my original research, I found that the typical congregation in North America drew an adult crowd that was 61% female and 39% male. And it's important to understand that no other world religion has a gender gap even up close to this. Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, and of course, uh, Islam draw a much closer to gender balanced uh, congregation. In fact, Mormons and Muslims, the two fastest growing religions in America right now are both male heavy. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very important if you want your church to grow, to draw in men, because once a church begins to, uh, uh, well, I always say this, once a church is 70% female, you can write its obituary. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you cannot, uh, the church is a two winged bird. You need both masculine and feminine spirit. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have both, the church will either uh, topple into legalism if it's too masculine, masculine, Mm -hmm. Or it'll topple into uh, liberalism if it's too feminine. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it really is. You know, what I've noticed is the real imbalance is in the single contribution. In fact, I, I often this is one of the things that I look in when I when I go to a church, and I like to visit new churches and just check uh -huh. them out. How many single, like under forty, single men are there in the church? And some of these you know, places, that, that's yeah. hardly any, hardly any. That's the real deficit. I, you know, I don't have any hard numbers on that, but I can tell you an experience I had a few years ago. I spoke at a very large church in Oklahoma and asked all the young single men age 18 to 30 to stand up. Now, I, I probably spoke to 2,000 people that morning, mm -hmm. and only 14 men stood up in two services. Wow. So if you contrast that with Jesus' disciples, probably 11 of the 12 were young single men age 18 to 30. <laughs> So we've definitely changed from a guy-oriented religion to de a grandma-oriented religion. Yeah. You know, some of that changes, um, you know, men get married, and then they have kids, and then a lot of times they go to church. But they are kind of a lot of ways dragged to church by their wives sometimes. Um, you know, one thing that I have definitely observed is it's, you know, for married couples, it's typically the woman who decides where the family goes to church and therefore, you know, where the tithe money goes. And if she gets unhappy for any reason, they're going to switch churches. I mean, it just seems to be the case. Men seem to kind of treat religion as like, well, that's kind of her gig. And this is even in conservative denominations. Like, that's kind of her thing. It's more her thing. It's more important for her to be happy than it is for me to be happy. So I'm just going to go along with what makes her maximally comfortable, where she gets engaged. And then again, if she has a falling out with somebody in the church, and it's like, okay, now we got to move. <laughs> Kind of yeah, it, it, you're right. Um, in l most families, the relig religion falls under the mother's portfolio. She takes care of the kids' education. Uh, she takes care of the medical, uh, you know, making sure the kids have their doctor's appointments. Uh, it, it, a lot of in a lot of families, a man would no sooner choose a church than choose drapes. It's just right. something that that women do. And unfortunately, that causes the boys who grew up in these families, you know, they can see that religion is mom's thing. Mm -hmm. And it causes great attrition as these boys reach 12, 13, 14, and they're desperate to prove their manhood. Uh, they're going to jettison religion because they've seen that it's mom's thing and not dad's. Right. I do think, you know, I, and I'm actually planning to write about this because I really feel that men do sort of like take certain elements of the household and say, you know, that's like, so that's my wife's fear, and I don't want to have anything to do with them. I mean, a lot of men, like their wives even buy their clothes for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, they buy everything for them. And it, it, so it, it, there was the, the famous Gillette ad uh, that they did not long ago. They got a lot of, got a pushback when it was sort of like toxic masculinity ad. Yeah. And one of the things I said is, you know, probably women buy most of the shaving cream because <laughs> most guys <laughs> don't even like pick what shaving cream they buy. And when you sort of abdicate your responsibility to even make yeah. purchasing decisions for yourself, don't be surprised when this goes like directions, you know, you don't want to do. So I, I certainly am a little bit on board with men are a little apathetic um, in some areas. I don't have the stats at the top of my head, but like women control the vast bulk of consumer spending in America. Yeah, something like 80%. Yeah. yeah. So it's this idea that like, you know, men earn, mo you know, with money. there's this income gap. But when it comes to who spends the money in a household, 
uh, you know, the wife is certainly in control or disproportionately influential in, in most of the spending. And I think that was one of my takeaways from the book was the primary customer segment that Christianity targets is women. And therefore, everything is designed to attract the women, and mm -hmm. which then attracts more women. And again, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Did they serve the women because that's who was showing up? Or did they choose it that way? But it does seem to be... Um, I kind of looked at your book. It's actually you describe it anthropological. I kind of looked at it as a business school case study. You get all the mm -hmm. statistics on the whole, here's who's listening to Christian radio, here's who doing this. And it's like, yeah, this is like Harvard Business School saying, yeah, they decided to target this particular, you know, women with kids demographic and the old, you know, these older women. There's like these female demographics that the church is really coming after that seems to disproportionately receive a lot of the attention because they are the people... Uh, they are the people consuming Christianity. They're the people buying all the Christian books, listening to the Christian music. Yeah. Uh, so in essence, they're just responding to the market. I do think there's some of that. Well, there's a huge uh, untapped or available market when women get an empty nest mm -hmm. uh, because they've suddenly got money. Uh, you know, because their husbands are probably or, you know, they may have retired from work or their husbands may have a good income in mm -hmm. their 50s. That's typically when we have peak earning power and they have no children to care for. Well, those maternal instincts don't go away. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, good hearted women redirect their their maternal energies into the church through the nursery, through the youth group, through benevolences. And, and this is a good thing on its face. Uh, the danger comes when uh, in the denominations that have female elders and leaders, they bring those maternal energies to the leadership of the church mm. and they make grandma type decisions. Well, you know, there's this gay couple that wants to get married in our church. And I know what the Bible says, but they're just such lovely people. And, you know, Jesus would love them. He would say yes to their, to their you know, and so we get a softening of doctrine. And, you know, from the from the kindest heartedness, you know, from the best mm -hmm. motivation, wanting to be kind to people, doctrine softens. And then you go down the, the road to theological adventurism, liberalism. And then that's a death knell for your church because young families don't want to raise their children in a church that's theologically ambiguous. They're not looking for a youth leader who says, hey, you need to go out and experiment with your sexuality right. or, hey, transgenderism is fantastic. You ought to try it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's not the message most parents are looking for right. when right. they're the looking for a church. That's why a lot of people go back to church when they have kids, because they want their kids in kind of indoctrinated in a, moral, you know, a, moral, a traditional, they want, a tra traditional morality, basically. Moral scruples. Yeah, even even liberal, the, even the most liberal parents don't choose like transgender youth leaders. I ran a Google search for uh, openly gay youth leader, transgender youth leader. I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find a single church in America, hmm. even among the, you know, the way out lefty, you know, churches. They're, they are not there because parents won't put up with it. Parents are looking for moral certainty for their kids. They're looking for um, bedrock principles that they can build their lives on. And, uh, you know, th these squishy, ambiguous uh, women led churches, and they're almost all women led. Uh, just don't, they just don't stick with the rules. They stick with relationships. Mm. Yeah. And I know it's not always the case that uh, these churches are like that. You know, when I, when I lived in New York, I visited Hillsong church there a few times and mm -hmm. they've had some, some challenges recently. Uh, but you know, they had five or six services a day, all packed. Sometimes you'd have mm -hmm. to stand in line to get in. You have to sit in an overflow room mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I went to the 10, a, you know, the 10 AM service, which I think might be their oldest it, oldest congregation, it's like the one where you bring your parents from out of town, but the They're median earliest, age yeah. was like 24. Yeah. Uh, you know, I felt like, man, I shouldn't be here. They're going to try to, you're going to arrest me or something, especially since I'm wearing a trench coat because it was raining. Yeah. And, um, you know, there were a lot of guys. There were a lot of single guys in there, very obviously. Mm -hmm. It was overwhelmingly single. So some churches are, you know, attracting attracting mm -hmm. men. But, you know, that's, that's, one of my, that's one of my barometers that I use. I've learned... Uh, some some rules of thumb for like judging various aspects of a church. Like one of the things I've di I've discovered is you can kind of position a, a church theologically just by listening to the announcements. Hmm. If the announcements are primarily about service opportunities, it's a very liberal church. If it's primarily about internal church activities, it's a much more conservative church. Are they talking about Bible studies and stuff or stuff like that? Or are they talking about the soup kitchen? Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, you should probably be talking about both, but you could kind of like sense where people are on the, on the spectrum just by that. And, and that's one thing I look at. Does this church have any younger single adult men in it? 
and um, you know, there's this Lutheran church, um, you know, the uh, in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America by my um, apartment in New York. I went there one day. It was you have know, a great liturgy. They do all the the Bach, you know, uh, yeah. cantatas and the correct liturgy. I mean, they're really amazing. And it was actually a pretty well patronized congregation. A lot of young fans. Mm-hmm. But I look, man, I don't see any younger single men anywhere. I could didn't see one. I'm like, so that tells you something is there's something not healthy in the demographics. I think. Yeah, well, I mean, liberal churches believe that we transform the world and that transforms hearts. Evangelical mm-hmm. churches, we transform hearts and that transforms the world. It's that we both believe the same thing. It's just a question of which is which is a uh, primary, which comes mm-hmm. first. So I think that's the what you're describing. That w- you can tell the church's theology by whether they're focused on transforming individual hearts, which is the more evangelical approach, or are they out doing world transformation through mm-hmm. good works? Uh, you know, I think for men, particularly young men. And you've, you know, you've read all the mythopoetic literature and, you know, Iron John and all that stuff. Okay. There, there is a process through which me- young men have to die and be reborn. Mm-hmm. And that's the heart transformation. That's why evangelical churches, particularly mega churches that focus on heart transformation first, are much more appealing to young men than these older churches that are focused solely on good works. Because a young man's greatest need is to be transformed from a boy into a man, from an irresponsible child into a responsible man. Mm-hmm. And so uh, churches that preach that so- sort of message, you can be born again, are much more appealing to those than say, hey, we just need to go out and do a soup kitchen. Mm-hmm. What are your great lines? You quote somebody in the book. You say, you know, a wise Texan once told me, men don't go to church because they've been. <laughs> and I thought, that yeah. was a, I thought that was a good one. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the attributes that you flag as uh turnoffs to men in church. And I'll start with the music. Um, yeah. y- you mentioned K-Love, like the radio network. Tell us, tell us about yeah. K-Love. Well, uh, a few years back, I had a chance to interview the uh, program director at K-Love, and he openly admitted that 67% of their listeners were female, and just 33 were male, uh, among adults, that is. Uh, you can't c- account for boys who are strapped in the back of the minivan. They don't count. Mm-hmm. But, but among adults, it was two-thirds women. Uh, up to 85% of the Christian products are bought by women. Uh, over 80% of the non-ordained staff in church, that would be church secretaries, uh, lay staff and stuff, are female. So, yeah, there's definitely, you know, men may have the pulpit. They may control the, the what we would call the upper echelon or the, the highest leadership positions of the church, but they are generals leading an army of women. Hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, when I listen, I've listened to some K-Love, and mm-hmm. to me, it, it's like light rock love songs to Jesus. Yeah. And I think, I actually do think that kind of that kind of Christian music, uh, l- light rock music, and country music, because country pop music, are all made by the same people in Nashville. You know, yeah. it's like the same group of people. They're all sort of the exact same song. There's just a few tweaks on them in, in terms of what they are. Uh, you know, I'll I'll jump in there. Uh, you know, it's not just K Love. It's it's many Christian radios use use a liner that sounds something like this: "Safe for the whole family." Mm-hmm. That's their tagline. That's their mm-hmm. marketing promise: "Safe for the whole family." And, you know, and boys, it's just poisoning boys' hearts because you know mm-hmm. they're driving around in the back seat of the minivan year after year, listening to their mom playing K Love on the radio or whatever the local Christian radio station, talking about how safe Christianity is. Now, Mm -hmm. that's wonderful for mom, because what does she want for her children? The whole reason she's driving a minivan with 16 airbags is because she's into safety, right? Right. What a boy is into when they're 13 and 14 years old. I mean, we're planting this time bomb in their hearts that the moment they get to that age where they want to throw safety to the wind, for 13 years, they've been sitting in the back of the van hearing how safe Christianity is. Mm -hmm. And so we're just telling them, please reject this, because this is all about your mom and this right. is not about you. Christianity is a car seat. It's something that keeps you safe. And boy, that is absolutely the wrong message to be teaching to young men. Yeah. I mean, you just listen to these to these songs and these lyrics. Like there's this one Hillsong uh, tune. It's the greatest of all romance. They call it. <laughs> these are like literal love songs to Jesus. And like, yeah. you can take a lot of the Hillsong ones, for example. You take a song like Oceans, listen to it without any words. I mean, if, if there was no words in it, just read the, just, yeah. Mm-hmm. You, or just oh, listening yeah. to the tune, you would think this yeah. is like a love, this is some kind of a love song or a ballad. And I even go back, you know, the, 
to, uh, I think it was in the 70s when Debbie Boone had this song, You Light Up My Life, mm -hmm. that yeah. was a love song that a lot of Christians used as sort of a worship song. And I think it was like, even back then, it's like, this is the exact same, it, it is. It's like, how many guys want to be singing, you know, love songs to Jesus like that? They're the same yeah. ones that, you know, you're listening to from like Delilah or something like that. <laughs> well, I put it this way, uh, you know, hymns, traditional hymns often led us onto the battlefield. Praise and worship leads us into the bedroom. Right. It's not it's not a mighty fortress is our God uh, anymore, you know. Well, but, you know, to, to give the songwriters credit, I think this is slowly beginning to change. I'm noticing a lot fewer romantic uh illusions. And I mm. think this might be because of the work I'm doing at Church for Men. I've just been blogging and talking about this, and I've been on some worship blogs and stuff. And a lot of worship leaders, even Matt Redman came back and said, you know, that line, I'm so in love with you. He says, if I had to rewrite that now, I would say, God, I'm so in awe of you, mm -hmm. because that more accurately describes our, our mm -hmm. uh, relation to God. And so, and speaking of relationship, you know, what's the number one metaphor that Christians use to describe discipleship today? A personal relationship with Jesus right. Christ. Now, who's more into relationships, men right. or women? Uh, obviously, women are. Women buy magazines about relationships. They watch movies about relationships. Hey, who's who's dating who? I mean, women are just way more interested in that stuff than men are. So when we describe the, the, uh, the gospel as a passionate intimate relationship mm -hmm. with a man who is totally into you yeah <laughs> i think we're definitely we're definitely appealing more to the female demographic than the male yeah to to be sure to be sure now you mentioned you got a lot of reviews i wasn't there when the book first came out what mm. was the reaction or the response to the book you know it's been surprisingly positive uh you know i think there is a realization uh, among many churchgoers that something is wrong here. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a lot of support from women with bo with uh, mothers, mothers of young men who uh, are seeing their boys turning away from the church at age 10, 11, 12, 13. They really want to know, you know, what is it about church that is driving young men away? Uh, I, I'll give you a positive and negative about, about children growing up in church. Uh, right now, the Sunday school is undergoing, undergoing a complete transformation for mm -hmm. the better. And churches like my own church here in Anchorage, Alaska, are leading the way. They've uh, changed the name of Sunday School to Adventure Land. Uh, they do a lot more kinetic activities, more running around the room, uh, more hands-on activities, hands-on lessons, object lessons. The boys really like it. Now, what's interesting is youth group is becoming less boy-friendly. Hmm. Uh, youth group uh, used to be, you know, the three G's games, goofiness, and God, uh, mm -hmm. lots of pizza, pie in the face, silly stuff. And, but then there'd be, you know, the serious times as well. This is the youth group that I grew up with that, that led me to faith in Jesus because we had fun, but then we got down to business with the Bible. Mm -hmm. Today's youth group is almost exclusively a, a sitting, uh, sitting still type experience. Uh, there's a lot of singing. And the reason we sing so much in youth group is because uh, we have these youth praise bands now. Youth leaders have figured out they can, inv they can involve six or eight kids by creating a band. Mm -hmm. And so they find the more I artistic... I think Hillsong did that, too. That was one of the well, things Hillsong did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, find the, they scoop up the more artistic-type boys who knit their own hats and put them in the band. And, you know, coffee culture type boys, there's nothing wrong with these boys, but they're not going to get the jock boys in the door with 30 minutes of singing love songs to Jesus. So youth group is becoming a very sedentary, talky, singy, ex uh, emotional type experience. Uh, so we're losing a lot of boys there. And studies have shown that by uh, age of 18 uh, or by the end of youth group, youth groups have 21 percent more girls than boys in participation. So they have set the stage for the uh, female hmm. heavy church of the future by age 18. You know, when you were talking about some of these changes to, to Sunday school, you know what? It reminded me a little bit of, of the muscular Christianity movement. And, you know, I, I always tell people, look, this idea that, like, I've discovered anything about the female skew of Christianity, that's not true. This has been something that's been discussed probably going back to, like, the dawn of industrialization. I do think industrialization caused people to start talking about a crisis of manhood because yes. it seems like things are dang in. You know, muscular Christianity, you know, did a lot of good, but it was ultimately an ineffective movement. So I'm kind of wondering how, you know, are we kind of repeating some of the same things that kind of didn't work last time? 
No, I'm going to push back on you. I think mm -hmm. muscular Christianity is the reason Christianity is so strong today. Mm -hmm. And what you're referring to is a movement that came out of the Victorian era uh, when we began, when America and England began to industrialize and people began gathering in cities and stopped uh, uh, working on farms, there began to become a softening of men. And no more, no, that, that softening was uh, very apparent in the churches. We had a feminization of the clergy. We had uh, lot, large numbers of men abandoning church to work in mines, mills, and factories. They were too tired or, or they were gone on Sundays. And so they were separated from their families and they became separated from the church. And so this issue became a huge uh, area of concern. And so we saw the founding of organizations like the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association in London in 1844. And they, they YMCA actually coined the term bodybuilding. They wanted to bring more, uh, a more masculine feel to the gospel. And then the YMCA spread like wildfire through the America. In the 1920s, the YMCA was the single largest hotelier in the yeah. United States. So many, they put up so many men uh, right before, after the war and before the depression. And then we also saw the founding of organizations like the Boy Scouts of America in 1905 over in England. And so, and you know, church camps, we had, there were no church camps until the muscular Christianity uh, uh movement said, you know, we need to get boys and kids out into nature again because they're trapped in these cities. And so what's interesting is that the largest uh, proponents of muscular Christianity were the mainline denominations, Presbyterians, Methodists, Episcopalians, etc. The churches that have completely feminized today were actually very man oriented. After World War II, it was very fashionable for men to return from the theater of war and join one of these churches right that had baptized themselves in the gospel of men. And those churches grew like wildfire. They well, drove the- The 50s the, was the high water market church attendance in the United States. Right, and the, and the high water was the main line, the liberal main mm -hmm. line. They, they weren't liberal then. They had gone through the muscular Christianity movement. They had the church camps. They had the men's retreats. They, they had Boy Scout troops at camps. I mean, they were guy oriented. But then in the 1970s, feminism came in. They brought in female elders and leaders and pastors, and that just washed that away in a generation. And the men left. They left religion to the women. They said, hey, you gals, you've got that. I'm going to go play golf. Mm -hmm. And we see the huge declines since then. So was muscular Christianity a success? Maybe not in its own to it. Not, a, not to its own credit, but I believe a lot of the uh, church infrastructure and the growth that we enjoy today was under undergirded by the efforts of those uh, men back in the 1800s and early 1900s. Yeah. yeah you, you know, you talk a lot about like the mainline churches and obviously you're a conservative, and, but I remember mm -hmm. one of the things I remember from reading, uh, it struck me the very first time in the second edition, is you mentioned, I think it was this uh, woman who was a Methodist pastor who had read mm -hmm. your book yeah. and was making some changes to try to make her church more male friendly. And you were getting some grief. You were getting some grief from people that like you were helping some of these churches like attract men. You're, and, you, and I think you took yeah. an interesting point, like, look, I'm not here to sell one denomination or another. I'm helping to try to get more men in church. But it looked like some people kind of gave you some flack for it. You know, what, what kind of pushback did you get in some of these I cases? told, well, I told her story to shame the male pastors, actually. I said, yeah. if a five foot two female pastor can bring men into the church and bring mm -hmm. church growth with it, why can't you do it, buddy? Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't doing that as an advocate. I wasn't, you know, advocating, hey, women pastors are the greatest. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just simply saying that, you know, if a woman can do this, you can do it. And so, uh, and my hope, you know, I, I was, I was born and raised in the mainline church. I was a Lutheran as a child, uh, went to a Presbyterian church, served as an elder on a Presbyterian uh, board of, you know, the board of elders for a Presbyterian church, the session. And, you know, my heart is still grieved that the direction these churches are going. And I think if there were more masculine presence, more focus on mission instead of relationships, more focus on the rules mm -hmm. of the Bible and being willing to say no to people, less codependence with with uh, people in need or, you know, different pressure groups and stuff that we've seen since the men have left the governing boards. So that, you know, that's my that's my dog in this fight. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to say that you know, we should have women pastors or shouldn't have them. I'm just trying to say that if a woman can do this, so can the men. And if a mainline church can can reach men and anyone can. Great. Well, once again, people, for those of you who've joined in, I'm talking with David Murrow, author of the book, Why Men Hate Going to Church. And you can see a link to buy it in the show notes. It's a great book. It was really, I think, as you mentioned, it was a landmark when it came out in the New York Times. People were paying attention to this uh, mm -hmm. because it, it really hit a nerve. 
And, you know, it seems like there were some attempts to respond to this kind of men in the church through different ministries that mm-hmm. came along. And I'll get a lot of these were yeah. before my day. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it seems so the promise keepers were the most mm-hmm. famous one. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, and then they crashed and burned. So what happened with kind of men's ministries, you, you know, over the period when you were kind of writing and getting engaged in this this book? Promise Keepers crashed and burned in 1998 because of a fateful decision to stop charging admission to the events. The, the mm. thinking was, if we uh, lower lower the barriers to entry, we'll allow more impoverished men, because it was a lot of you know middle class and upper class men driving for us country, and there was thought that if we uh, take the admission away, we'll get more men. The exact opposite happened. Uh, once they took the admission fee away, uh, attendance imploded. And this, they learned something about men, a valuable lesson. If you don't charge a man something, he won't put any value on it. Mm-hmm. Whenever, I, whenever I do a men's course, I charge 10 bucks. And I, it's, it's a nominal amount. But once a man lays his money down, he'll be there. And I say, hey, it's 10 bucks. If you make all five sessions, I give you your money back. A little aside there. Uh, what's happened in men's ministry since then, we haven't had as many high profile men's ministries, but there's been a lot more foment, a lot more voices speaking mm-hmm. into the men's space. Guys like Tony Evans. Uh, I've served on the board of the National Coalition of Ministries to Men. We have over 100 organizations that are out there doing ministry to men. So it's still happening. And by the way, Promise Keepers is going to have their first stadium, full-size stadium rally in over a decade, July 16th and 17th, 2021 at AT&T Stadium in Dallas. So Promise Keepers is coming back with one large stadium event. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. I don't think we can judge the health of men's ministry based on large events. I think the the real strength of men's ministry is how many guys are getting together for coffee and Bible study at Denny's or Panera Bread on a Saturday morning. Uh, how many young men are being discipled by the older men? There's a great new program called Better Man, where older men actually gather up a group of a small group of men and disciple them through this video curriculum. And they, they absolutely will not proceed until each group has a mentor, mm-hmm. uh, a guy my age or, or, or up, you know, in his 50s, 60s or 70s who wants to inv- invest in men. So, yeah, there is a lo- there is actually a lot of uh, good activity going on in the men's ministry sphere. It may not be as high profile as it was during the Promise Keepers movement, but uh, ministry to men is proceeding. You know, one of the things I observed uh, that I think got very wrong in men's ministries and the church's approach to men um, I may become I may become back with, with, with a little different uh, little different approach than you on this is you know, the church seems to have gotten its idea along the way that the way you reach men is to be the drill sergeant you know and it's mm-hmm. like we're gonna we're gonna be like it's gonna be like full metal jacket we're gonna get in your face men want to be challenged but in fact all they do is sort of beat men up all day mm-hmm. you know man up because how many man up sessions have there been and it's like you know here's how you're screwing up so bad and yeah. You know, the promise keepers seem the predicate of the promise keepers seem to be that like, well, you know, um, you know, men aren't keeping their promises and all this. And I say, well, wait a minute, you know, women, you know, initiate 70 percent of all divorces, but the church never has and never will have a ministry urging women to keep their promises. I always like to say, <laughs> why does anybody right. ever tell women to keep their promises? I do think there's this sense in which the, ch- the church has basically been very, very negative. Even the people who were like famous for reaching men, like Mark Driscoll, he had this famous, how dare you rant? He's going on and on and on, tearing men up. Uh, you know, Matt Chandler ranting about boys who can shave. Uh, it's, it does seem to me that they've, they've really haven't, and I, I just look at how bad the church has done at reaching men. And I look at what, Jordan Peterson's doing great. <laughs> you know, Joe Rogan's doing great. There's a lot of people out there that are doing great uh, and who are challenging, like, you know, Peterson is challenging men in ways, but he's not, he's not just like blaming them for all the world's problems. You can tell he actually cares about these people and wants to build yeah. them up. I, you know, it just seems to me that the church has really kind of never quite figured out how to crack the code on doing ministry to men. My view on that is men do need the man up conversation, but it needs to come one on one from someone they trust. It doesn't mm-hmm. need to be berating them from the pulpit. Right. In front of your uh, wife and kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me emasculate you in front of yeah. your wife and kids. No, no. I, I mean, I agree with you. Even on Father's Day, uh, you know, we get beat up. Mothers are lionized. Men are challenged. So, right. uh, yeah, there is a place. I mean, there is a place for those man up conversations. But I do feel I do agree with you. I think the church has been too harsh on men, uh, not encouraging enough. 
And, uh, you know, Peterson, he's definitely, he, he definitely connects with men because not because he necessarily takes men's side, but because he's understanding toward the, the challenges that men face. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's been, you know, he's talking about the issues that men feel, but don't have any forum to, to speak of. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's why he has been a success and where maybe some reasons, some of the church efforts have failed. Yeah. I mean, if I, I would kind of be embarrassed, I mean, here's a guy that sold, you know, 3 million books and like selling out Texas, like, What's going on? And, um, you know, now I, I personally find that a lot of these self-help guys, self-improvement people, um, they don't resonate with me necessarily because so much of their shtick, and Peterson is a little bit less this way, but somewhat is this way. It's like, mm-hmm. it's all about relying on the self. You take a guy mm-hmm. like Anthony Robbins, Awaken the Giant Within. That's what <laughs> Yeah, he, yeah. Now, I think Robbins actually has a predominantly female audience. I mean, the people For I've sure. known who've been really into... So it's interesting to see which of these people are got, you know, attract the women which is, versus who attracts the men. There's got to be some, like, academic studies on that. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, it is uh, it, it is interesting to me. The other thing, um, and, and this is where I want to get into some of the stuff that was super prescient in your book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, is you make the argument, uh, you know, as I recall that you framed as men really put a premium on excellence mm-hmm. and most church services are just not that excellent. <laughs> and, and, and so, um, and that you said, look, these mega churches are getting it right because the mega churches are the ones that are excellent and they have that, the best production values and the best quality speaking. And, and, uh, you know, how, how does excellence play into this? Well, churches, we know how and why churches grow. 85% of church growth is driven by personal invitation. I call my friend mm-hmm. up. Hey, you want to go with me? Mm-hmm. Uh, almost none of it's walk-in. It's all, and especially when it comes to new Christians, 85% is personal invitation. Now, if I attend First Podunk Church with my 80 worshipers and the bad music and the kind of so-so sermon, I'm not going to invite my friend to that. If I attend 16,000 member Mega church, I know the music's going to be great. I know the sermon is going to be off the charts. I know the, the food service afterward is going to be excellent. I, I know everything, you know, the campus is going to be clean. It's going to be an impressive facility. Now, these things sound so carnal, right? They're so unspiritual. But all you're doing is you're setting a table for a man to think, if I invite my friend, I won't be embarrassed. And so that's been the secret sauce of the mega churches. Everything is done with excellent men. Not only enjoy those things, but they feel confident inviting their friends to enjoy mm-hmm. those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I um, I, you know, I, I've noticed like the average, you know, pastor pre the average sermon is pretty mediocre. Quite mm-hmm. frankly, it's not necessarily mm-hmm. great. The content isn't even necessarily that great. The presentation's not that great. But you go start looking at these top people, man. I mean. They're world class. I, I speak in front of audiences, you know, quite a mm-hmm. bit. And so I'm an above average public speaker. Mm-hmm. But now I, I went to the Gospel Coalition's conference this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's because it's here in Indiana. I live in Indianapolis. They have it here, you know, every time. And I'm like, man, these people are like top 1% speakers. They are mm-hmm. really, really good. I mean, you can see they've been coached, you know, mm-hmm. they've been scripted, they got the perfect audio visual down. They've got all the marketing. Mm-hmm. It's like, this is like, wor- I say it's like world-class marketing. Like this they're, is yeah, they're, Hollywood they're, yeah. grade production. And these guys are yeah. super, pers- these guys are super good. They're cr- and they're craftsmen, you know, it's yeah. not these, these sort of th- sermons just don't, don't just happen. And th- one of the secrets is, is they've been relieved of their uh, chaplaincy duties mm-hmm. in a small church of 80 people. A pastor might have to visit four people in the hospital that week. Uh, he might have to counsel three couples in crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, he just, he doesn't have time to put in 30 hours and create all these wonderful visuals like Andy Stanley does, who's got a staff to manage that for him. Right. And a professional PhD level research assistants and all the people behind them that it's like the politician, when they walk out on stage, it's not just them. These people have got like people. These are people who have people. Right. Right. Yeah. So, you know, in, in, I'm trying to be sympathetic to the guy with the 80 person church. Right. You know, I, I understand your travail. I know what <laughs> you're up against. I, but, but even so, you know, even if that's just the small church that, that you operate, you can still include an engaging object lesson. Mm-hmm. We have to understand, especially now that so much preaching is on video, video is, uh, is television. 
Mm -hmm. uh, past pastors don't use visuals because they don't trust them. They weren't taught how to use them. They think that it's a gimmick. It's not. I mean, if you look at Jesus's teaching, half of his lessons either include a some sort of an actual physical visual or mm -hmm. they're built around some sort of a metaphorical object. You mm -hmm. know, pastors have even even the busiest pastor can up his game and increase his viewership and his impact both in the room and on camera by including more visual elements. And so that's one of the things I'm starting to do is I'm starting to work with pastors, coach them into how become be, to become better visual communicator because I work in the TV business. That's my day job. So mm -hmm. a little ad there for what I'll be doing. <laughs> yeah. So just out of, I got some comments from the audience. I'm going to try to get to these questions before the end. One of them um, uh, from John here, do churches, mega churches have much higher men's participation? The gender gap in, uh, in a typical, as I said in the introduction, the typical North American church draws an adult crowd that's 61% female. In most mega churches, it's close to 50-50. Uh, it's hard to completely close the gender gap because as men flood into the church, women flood in faster. I often say mm -hmm. there's nothing more attractive to a godly woman than a godly man. And mm -hmm. women love worshiping in the presence of men who are not just there with their hands in their pockets, mm -hmm. but men with a smile on their face, men who are being transformed by the love of God. That's a very attractive and comforting thing to women. So it's it's hard to gender balance the church because women come in faster. Yeah. When I first read this book and I was sharing with it, uh, you know, some of my pastor at the time, he was... He was very negative because one of the things that you kind of predict in there is like, look, there might be like, and I may get into the number wrong, there are going to be like 50 churches left in America by the time 200, this is done. Yeah. 200 churches, they're all going to be mega churches, it's going to be these top dog guys, and all these other churches are just going to go out of business. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, I look at the landscape here in Indianapolis, there are a number of big multi-site mega churches, non-denominational mm -hmm. mega churches that kind of dominate it. There are actually mm -hmm. some very strong mainline churches left here, but you mm -hmm. know that's kind of what's that's what's happening. You know, you you know, you you got to go to a flagship mainline congregation, or you go to one of these like big mega churches, and I think I think people miss out there. They're saying you're advocating for this out this uh, outcome, but this is sort of like where we're going, and this is where yeah. we were going, and it does seem to be that way. No, just as Walmart wiped out Main Street, mega churches are going to wipe out the little church on the corner, and uh, COVID is another factor in that the shutdown of those churches they may not have had the online tools necessary to reach their congregations they may not have had online giving in place so it's just going to be a very stressful time for that small church now that's not to say that there aren't opportunities for small churches as i said in the previous response any pastor can become a more effective communicator both online and on screen but they have to learn their craft and uh, that's I pastors have to humble themselves and say, you know, it's not just me standing up waving a Bible for 40 minutes. Right. I have got to learn to connect with a visual culture. Right. And uh, so I think, yeah, mega churches are putting smaller churches out of business, but there are also opportunities on the edges for individual pastors and small congregations to really make an impact through better teaching and uh, through more effective ministry. Yeah, it, you know, I thought, yeah, I thought this was super prescient because you were sort of writing this pre-internet when kind of video streaming started taking on a life of its own. And now yeah. you have uh, so many people who just attend church virtually. They may yes. not even attend a church in their own city. And, uh, it, you know, it's kind of it's kind of strange. Like a lot of these can't, you know, one of these, um, one of the local mega churches here, they opened a new location near me. So I went to check it out. And during the sermon, they said, hey, we're going to have launch an official new campus that we call our virtual campus. And I think most yeah. of these, most of these mega churches now have an official like virtual campus pastor because people are just coming in, you know, guys like Mark Driscoll, you know, we're just bringing in huge numbers of people through mm -hmm. video. And so now people are sort of like, I hate to say it, it is a little bit like the, the, the second Timothy piece about finding the, the pastor will tickle your ears. You find a guy you like, he doesn't have to be in your town. I'm just going to watch him online. And then even if you go to a church locally, that guy's going to look like not so good, you know, compared to what well, you're seeing. Well, and to their credit, I mean, these churches are deeply grieved that they have so many people online and they are doing their best to minister to these people. That's what the virtual churches are about, these virtual mm -hmm. campuses. They want to dedicate staff and volunteers to ministering to the people that they have online who may be in Sri Lanka or Australia or whatever. Mm -hmm. Obviously, these folks are not going to attend a physical ser service. So God bless them. They're trying. Mm 
Mm -hmm. But um, obviously the best solution would be physical presence. Uh, you know, people, people need people. They need to, if, if we've learned anything from masking in the last years, we need to see each other's faces. Right. And uh, so, you know, I'm praying that there would be a huge revival of physical uh, attendance. We're not seeing it yet. There still may be fears surrounding COVID or, or whatever. But there's also the tendency, you know, that men have, men have kind of a natural, I don't want to call it laziness, but uh, I think if there's an easier way for a man to do things, he will opt for it. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of men have spent the last 16 months watching church in their pajamas mm -hmm. and they've realized how great it is not having to get the kids out the door and you know, having to face all that stress. So I think it's going to be a harder sell to get men back into the house. But uh, to all those men who are listening, it's worth the effort. It's worth right. the effort to be physically present with the body of Christ uh, and not just watch it on TV. Yeah, I mean, I think COVID, it's gonna be interesting to see the results of that because I know there have been, uh, there's a big there's a big resortation of people going on in the church. It seems to be driven to me. One, it was driven by COVID in the sense of who's meeting in person and who's not. Mm -hmm. And the churches that, that were meeting were drawing in, drawing in people, the ones that were not, lost some people then it was masks whether you, you you know whether you wanted to wear a mask or not kind of a crazy issue yeah. and now right. kind of the whole woke thing is causing a bunch mm -hmm. of resortations so i think it would be really interesting to see um you know really interesting to see um y you know what happens with that yeah, yeah I'd, I'd like to see it too. I really don't, I, I haven't seen any new numbers. I just know that uh, in-person attendance, what's interesting, in-person attendance has fallen, but giving hasn't. Right. Uh, there's a lot of churches, I mean, the vast majority of churches have not seen a dip in giving, and that may be the trillions of stimulus dollars that are being pumped into the economy. Uh, I don't know if that's a long-term trend, but people are continuing to support their congregations financially, all but the smallest ones. Yeah. So, you know, that's a good sign. I mean, it, it says that people, where your money is, there your heart will be. Yeah. So people, people, Christians' hearts are still with their churches. So that's a very good sign. Got a question here from Thomas. He says, this comes across as seeker-friendly. And I guess, you know, again, the knock, I think that maybe where he's getting at is, you know, the knock on a lot of these mega churches is, you know, they're great. They got a model to get people in the door, welcome them, but it's very theologically light. And, mm -hmm. you know, Willow Creek famously did all these surveys and they, they were always yeah. unhappy that they were not getting the kind of development and discipleship that they aspired to, for example. You know, how would you respond to that? Um, you know, I think mega churches are all across the theological spectrum. Uh, it's not an area. My main area is focusing on getting people into the pews. Once mm -hmm. they're there, it's up to the church mm -hmm. to deal with them. So, you know, I really don't have a lot of expertise in that area and really can't comment uh extensively on that. Yeah. Well, I think part of it is you, we're just a little bit talking about what is happening. And that's where I do think there's mm -hmm. this, there is this idea. It's like, I'm not designing the system I would prefer. I'm kind of like saying this is what's actually been going on. And we have to like, we can't just pretend that, you know, like people going to their, to their, you know, preferred pastor guru over the internet is not happening. That's like a real, that's yeah. like a real trend. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, yeah, we, uh, I mean, just to comment on what you were saying, you know, the commentary says this comes across as seeker friendly. You know, um, it's like I said before, we do need to continually have hard conversations with people about sin in their lives. The, but it's not necessarily wise to blast them from the pulpit about their hmm. sins. Those th those conversations, especially with men, need to come from a trusted mentor or someone who is discipling them. That's really the deficit. It's not that the pulpit isn't forceful enough about condemning sin. I think the pulpit needs to be welcoming, but then there needs to be a process whereby individuals can mentor one another and say, look, you need to get that sin out of your life. And that's proven to be the most effective model. Uh, you know, we live in a very we live in a very sensitive culture right now. Unfortunately, people are not used to hearing about their their sin and their deficits. And so if you just get up there and blast away at, at you know, those blah, 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 blahs, you know, you're probably going to draw drive more people away than you will get. You remember, we're fishing for men. We're not catching them. We're not preaching to the saints in the aquarium. Right. So, All right. Well, we're going to try to limit this for an hour. So what I want to do is I want to ask one mm -hmm. more question about a great passage in the book, and I'm going to try to take mm -hmm. a few of these questions that came in um, sure. from the audience. One of the things that you did, you did this test where you took mm -hmm. two lists of attributes mm -hmm. and you asked people which one of these best represents Jesus? So where did you get these attributes from? 
Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually give the test. Why not? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so I got this is on page seven of my book. Sorry, yeah. I have to put my glasses on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So I have two sets of values, and I'm going to read the first set. It's competence, power, efficiency. Which which set best va- represents the values of Jesus? Okay, okay, so as you're listening to these values, think, okay, which one is more like Jesus? Set A is competence, power, efficiency, achievement, skills, proving oneself, results, accomplishment, objects, goal orientation, self-sufficiency, success, and competition. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's set A. Set B is love, communication, beauty, relationships, support, help, nurturing, feelings, sharing, relating, community, loving cooperation, and personal expression. Now, I've given this, every time I give a talk, live talk, I've read these sets of values to the audience. And whether that audience is men or women, Christian or non-Christian, secular, whatever, always people are more comfortable with that second set, love, Mm. communication, beauty, relationships. When they think of Jesus... They think of those values. And then I tell them where they come from. They're from chapter two of the book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. <laughs> and the first set are the values of Mars, the values that naturally come to men. And the second set everyone ever, that everyone's comfortable with uh, assigning to Jesus are the feminine values that come from Venus. Mm. So you can see right away, we have this perception, whether we're male or female, godly or not. We have this perception that we are more comfortable assigning feminine values to Jesus. And so you, you can see right away the problem we're dealing with is that <laughs> men perceive Christianity as something that is womanly. And we've got to overcome that and help them to understand that, no, yeah. Christianity is a, is a manly path. It's not a womanly path. Right. I always love it. You take a take a, so, some set of data or some criteria, something that was developed for one pur- purpose, and then use it somewhere else and see what you get with it. So I thought that was really yeah. uh, I thought that was really interesting. So I want to I want to try to get to some of these questions and comments here. Uh, Michael just uh, uh, said, as a younger man myself, I can tell you the reason Jordan Peterson appeals to me more than many Christian voices is because he speaks more about real life than abstract theology. Mm-hmm. So I thought that's an interesting uh, good comment. Interesting, interesting one. Mm-hmm. And um, then we had a, a commenter named Grant that says, I ran a men's fish fry. It had more men at it than at uh, Sunday morning service. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, basically the church said, by the way, we're not going to pay for this. <laughs> we're not we're not going to fund what you're doing. But uh, he went on. So I think that I think that was interesting. Let me scroll. Well, back. well Grant, uh, let me say, Grant, you've got bigger fish to fry. So. <laughs> <Da-dum>. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let me see. Let me see what I can find. Uh, Here's another question about Jordan Peterson from Bert. Do you think Jordan Peterson's mythical reading of the Bible is responsible for some of his resonance? Is biblical literalism less resonant with young men for some reason? I guess it's oh a great my, question. Yes. I don't know the answer. Um, yeah, I you know I probably don't either, but I think you're on the right track, Bert. I think. Uh, you know, we we have this postmodern society. There is no objective truth. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's how men are raised, and so sometimes you have to kind of, uh, if you're fishing for men, you've got to kind of put that lure out. Let's be a little uncertain. You know, let's 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 look into the mysteries of the Bible. Uh, at some point, you've got to say no. This is this is how it is. You know, but I think you can kind of lure them in a little bit with being a little more. Uh, what are mm-hmm. we? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think mythical or mythopoetic. Mm-hmm. You know, 20 years ago, uh, John Eldridge wrote the best best selling Christian men's book of all time, Wild at Heart, mm-hmm. and he talked about mythopoetic archetypes. Right. Peterson is also into archetypes, and I think archetypes are tremendously helpful mm-hmm. in reaching young men in particular. Right. Then. Um... I got one here from uh, Foff. I think maybe the username coming through is, could teaching about the brave men throughout church history help this issue? Have you seen anything on that? Uh, you know, I was inter- there's interesting. There's an old book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's been yeah. around for hundreds of years. And I've often wondered if what 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 would happen if somebody used that as a youth group curriculum, for example. Focus on how much you're going to suffer if you keep coming to youth group. Uh, I had a youth leader who uh, told us once, I remember this from when I was 16. He said, Christianity, properly practiced, will result in your death. Hmm. There is no other way this ends. Mm-hmm. And boy, I came out of there thinking, yeah, let's do it. (laughs) Let's do this. I mean, every young man has that death wish. We want to do something that is truly challenging. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, I think there might be some value in that. Yeah. Uh, You you mentioned Fox's Books of Martyrs was like the second or third best-selling book for for like the longest time. It was unbelievable. It was right right up with the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, and then like Fox's Books of Martyrs. And uh, it's a book most people have never heard of today. 
Yeah, uh, the the guys, uh, DC Talk, a few years ago, mm -hmm. did a book called Jesus Freaks, and it was all about the martyrs in the church. It was, it was kind of an updated version of Fox's mm -hmm. book and uh, sold really well among young men. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think the story, telling the stories, you know, it's one thing the Catholics do very well that Protestants don't, is tell the story of the saints, the heroes of the faith who stood up for the faith, mm -hmm. at, often at the cost of their own lives. Mm-hmm. Got another comment here on uh, Peterson. It says, Counter counterintuitively, the mythical reading draws more meaning and implications from the text, text than the exegesis of people who claim to really believe it. I you got I some smart You got yeah, some smart I, listeners yeah, here. Yeah, These, yeah, yeah. Exegesis? Yeah, yeah big yeah, one. That's, that's right. There you go. <laughs> got got a, a question from Greg. Would beefing up the Lord's table as the central feast of Sunday worship, not just as an add-in, engage men? Uh, well, that would that would speak to Catholicism again, which is focused uh. on on the Eucharist, uh, which and Catholicism is not packing men in. So I'm not sure making it the central act mm. of worship. I would suggest uh, a, a more robust celebration of the Lord's table. Mm. Uh, use real bread, real wine for the adults. Uh, you know, something. Or just make it uh, an after. I always thought that it would be cool to do a shorter service and then adjourn, adjourn for an actual meal, mm -hmm. making the Eucharist part of that meal. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's a lots of room for experimentation in that area. And, you know, I would encourage pastors, uh, church planters to try making uh, the Lord's Supper something a more robust experience than a little teeny cracker and a little teeny uh, yeah. glass of Welch's. Yeah, we well, you know it, it is interesting that you know I went to uh, I went to this mega church here that will be na made uh, remain nameless. That was the one that opened a new location, and yeah. they were talking about their virtual campus. And I was walking in, and there's this box. And, you know, my wife she thought it was like party favors or whatever, and it was this little, the little communion, in, you know, prepackaged communion. And we kind of laughed, and now everybody's using that on account of COVID. Like everybody switched to that. But uh, you know, one yeah. thing I will say that I have observed is there has definitely been a swing back towards more liturgical sacramental practices mm -hmm. in these churches. I mean, even Russell Moore, uh, who is, you know, a big shot in the SBC mm -hmm. until recently in his book, he's like, you know, was, we, yeah. we ought to be celebrating communion every week. And I'm like, that's practically heresy for a Southern Baptist, <laughs> you know, quarterly right. communion, best not sell it. So yeah, I think there is, um, you know, I think there is something to, um, to it um there which is interesting and then i just had a uh i just got a uh, somebody from uh from gerard that voices of the martyrs has an updated yeah. version of fox's book of martyrs Thank so you. um somebody again you know bert again the prepackaged communion a great artifact of 2020 you should put that in a time capsule yeah uh, right and see what happens so uh so anyhow, D David, thank you so much. I, I appreciate you being game to take questions from the audience for coming to show the book. Again, you should hold the book up. It's uh, Why Men Hate Going to Church. Uh, it, you know, it's second edition now from 2011, still very relevant. Uh, and again, I think some of it around the mega church stuff and you know, the more people going to the, the, the top people, the power law distribution has, has been very prescient. So check it out. Again, there's a link to buy in the, uh, in the show notes. And again, subscribe, hit the subscribe button on YouTube. And uh, make sure you uh, subscribe to the Masculinist newsletter at themasculinist.com if you haven't already. And David, before we go, is there anything you're doing now new that you want to plug? That uh, you know, because I'm kind of I'm kind of plugging the old stuff. We always want to make sure we we plug the new album, sort of thing. Yeah, uh, a couple, just a couple of things, real quick. My latest book is called Drowning in Screen Time. And so this is an issue with men. Uh, a lot of, especially in post-pandemic, a lot of men have lost their families over their obsessions with pornography, video gaming, et cetera. This is a path back to health. So I encourage men to pick that up. And then another thing is, because I've worked in the television business for the last 40 years, I'm going to be launching a cohort of pastors. I'm going to be personally training pastors in how to become uh, better visual communicators so that you can create an, an online audience that actually reaches more men. You know, you don't have to be the guy with the 30,000 and the big fancy cameras. Uh, I'm going to be teaching you techniques that will make you a better communicator, uh, uh, both in the room and on screen. I don't have a name for it yet, but I'll be rolling that out in the third or fourth quarter of this year. Great. I'd, I'd love to see it. You know, I need mm -hmm. more, um, I always say I need more voice coaching. I need more, you know, video coaching I've done. There's a lot to be like, like I, I'm not ashamed of saying, time to take some coaching when there's things yeah. you know you don't know about because you, you know it's not like everybody's you think these guys are all naturals but i'm like pretty much they've all had great coaching too so yeah so good luck with that again thank, thank you very you. much david i appreciate you joining yeah it's been my pleasure thank you aaron